So uh, this is a session on nanomaterials and uh, each uh, uh, talk has uh, 20 minutes. So you have 15 minutes of talk and then uh, please leave five minutes for questions. Uh, I will uh, let you know uh, five minutes and three minutes before the end of the talk. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, please welcome Gal, Gal Shacha Mikhaeli, who will talk to us about multifunctional carbon-based uh, nanocomposites. Please, Gal. Okay. And uh, please mute, uh, everybody else mute your uh, microphones. You can see the presentation? Yes, I can. Good luck. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Gal Shachar Michaeli, and today I'm going to talk with you about a um, hybrid uh, system of carbon based composites. This work was supervised by uh, Professor Oren Rege from the Chemical Engineering Department, uh, department in uh, Ben Gurion University of the Negev. So first I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about what composite material is, what the material that we use in this research, what was the, our main research goal, uh, how we thought about this research, what our previous work that was actually the motivation for this research. And finally, I'm gonna talk about the performance of a hybrid composite uh, as we found in uh, this research. So, Composite materials uh, consist of two different components, fillers and matrix, that, uh, which possess different physical and chemical uh, properties, that when we mix them together, we can change the matrix properties and adjust it to, it need, to its needs. We can either add one filler, which will be single filler system, or more than one filler, which will be hybrid filler system. For each uh, composite material, we need to um, decide what will be our metrics and what will be our fillers. The metric that I'm today gonna focus on is the epoxy polymer that we choose because it is widely used in actually every aspect in our day life, start from automotive industry and electronics devices. The filler that, uh, the filler that, I, uh, that we used is carbon-based filler from the nanometric scale, where the first one is carbon nanotube, CNT, which has cylindrical shape and it's one dimensional. And the second is graphene nanoplatelets, GNP, which is stacked graphene, uh, graphene sheets and it's two dimensional. We chose this, um, these fillers since they have extraordinary proper, uh, mechanical, electrical, and thermal property that when we, um, compare them to the epoxy, we can see why they are great candidates to improve those, those um, uh, properties of the epoxy matrix. So what was actually our main research goal? The main goal was to create multifunctional composite material with the best um, property that we can, and it's obtained by enhanced mechanical properties and enhanced transport properties. First, I'm gonna talk on the mechanical properties. So as I said before, we chose the epoxy matrix. The epoxy matrix has a major weakness, which is the fracture toughness. The fracture toughness is the ability of material containing a crack to resist it, propagate and fracture. When we apply a weak force on epoxy sample, it will easily break. But when we mix it with nanofiller, as we can see here, such as CNT, the interaction between the crack and the filler will delay or stop the crack propagation. And I'm gonna talk with you shortly about the toughening mechanism of uh, the nanofiller that we used. So when we look on the mechanical properties, here we can see the relative fracture toughness, which is the fracture toughness of the composite divided by the fracture toughness of the meat epoxy. Here we can see the filler concentration, where uh, when filler mm -hmm. concentration, when filler concentration increase. Oh God, this is a really boring lecture. It's um, mute, Daniel. We can see that the fracture toughness increase up to a maximum optimal point, where after every addition of the filler will cause degradation of the mechanical properties. 
The final concentration at which we achieve to the maximum fracture toughness we'll call O and C, optimal nanofilar concentration. And you want it to be as low as possible. The second important term that we're gonna uh, look on is the robustness, which is the full width on half maximum of the peaks. And it's important, uh, it's important properties since you want it to be as higher as the robustness will be, the higher the range of uh, the filler that we will not see degradation of the mechanical properties. So the question is, how can we create a composite material with high fracture toughness and high robustness? So at first we need to look on the motivation of our work. So in our previous study, we did, we check um, the fracture toughness of single filler system of CNT and GNP. Here we can see the relative fracture toughness. Here we can see the filler concentration, where the triangular are the CNT and the diamonds are the GNP. In both of them, you can see it start in a increase in the fracture toughness and after uh, reaching some optimal uh, maximum uh, value of fracture toughness, we see degradation. The, um, we can see that the CNT filler concentration range is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5, and the GNP concentration range will be a one, uh, between one to 10. So as I, as I said before, we want to see the ONC and the robustness of both of the, the systems. We can see that the ONC of the CNT is 0.15 weight percent, and it's low in one order of magnitude than the GNP, which is 3.5 weight percent. But the robustness of the GNP is larger in two order of magnitude than the CNT. Than the CNT. So if you want to summarize all of uh, these two uh, single filler system, we can see that the carbon nanotube, the CNT system, is preferred due to its ONC, but the GNP is preferred due to its maximum fracture toughness and robustness. So the question is, why not both? Why not use both of these fillers, mix them together in the same composite to reach to a more optimal multifunctional composite material? So first, we look on previous study that was done on CNT and GNP with epoxy uh, composite. Here we can see the enhancement. Here we can see the total filler concentration, which is the concentration of the CNT and the GNP in the composite. In orange, we can see the flexural strength. In gray, we can see the tensile strength. And in red, we can see the fracture toughness, where the total filler concentration denoted by the black dots. In all of this research, they was fixed. Uh, the total filler concentration was fixed. And therefore, they didn't look on the robustness. So we asked, what about the robustness? And we said that we need to, um, to investigate it. So first, we need to understand what are the best ratio between CNT and GNP uh, to perform our study. After a, a very best uh, study, we found that the best uh, system will be different concentration of GNP with fixed 0.15 weight percent CNT which, as I remind you, is the ONC of the CNT single filler system. We observe the relative fracture toughness versus the total filler concentration, that is, again, the GNP and the CNT weight percent. And we saw that at first, there is increase in the mechanical properties, same as the single filler system. After that, we reach to some maximum fracture toughness value. And then when we add more filler, the fracture toughness uh, degradates. So we want to know what are, um, what are the mechanisms that attribute to this performance. And for that, we did fractography analysis using a, a scanning electron microscopy, SEM, and we did it for the fracture surface. So we found out that there is two major uh, toughening mechanisms. The first one is crack bifurcation. As you can see here, it's when the energy of the crack dissipate due to the split of the crack in two different sub-cracks. The second uh, toughening mechanism that we found was pull out. Um, when the filler is pulled out when it's break, here we can see the uh, hole that left after the GNP was pulled out. And here we can see the edges of the CNT that were pulled out 
as you can see in the schematic um, figure here. After we want to know what caused to the, degrad to the degradation of the, of the, uh, the fracture toughness, and we found out that the reason for that is the appearance of uh, air voids inside the composite. So after we saw the behavior of our hybrid system, we want to compare it to the different single filler systems. Here we can see the relative fracture toughness. Here we can see the total filler concentration where the uh, blue dashed line is the GNP to the single filler system. And in yellow dashed line is the graphite 3D single filler system. When we compare our, our I would say system that we can see here in red, we can see that it's very resembled to uh, the 3D single filler system, but with improved fracture toughness. So we assume that the Sorry, CNT- Sorry, no. five more minutes. Okay. So we assume that the CNT and the GNP create some 3D structure. And to confirm it, we use the Krieger duality semi-empirical model where we look on the critical volume fraction, which is the volume fraction where the network of the filler is formed, and on the intrinsic, intrinsic viscosity, which is dimensionless number, and it said to us the, uh, the contribution of the filler to the uh, system, um, to the uh, composite viscosity. In green, we can see the CNT. In blue, we can see the GNP. In yellow, we can see the graphite and in red, we can see the hybrid. And as we can see here, the hybrid and the graphite um, have the same value, which confirm to us that the CNT and the GNP actually create some 3D structure with some improved 3D, uh, 3D structure, as you can see in the illustration here. So until now, we talk about the mechanical property. And, if, and as I said before, we can see uh, our uh, main goal is to create multifunctional composite material. And we talk about the mechanical properties. And now we're going to talk about the transfer properties. But we need to understand why we need both of these, um, uh, both of these properties. And the reason for that is because there is some um, application that we need uh, the combination of both of them, such as thermal interface material. And it's when we have the heater and we have the heating, and there is air gap between them due to the roughness of their surface. And because of that, the heat doesn't transfer efficiently. But when we add to this air gap thermal interface material, uh, the heat start to uh, transfer more efficiently. And thermal interface material needs mechanical uh, stability along with highly thermal conductivity. So if we look on the thermal conductivity of our system, here we can see the thermal conductivity. Here we can see the relative thermal conductivity. Here we can see the total filler concentration. Where in, in green, we can see the CNT. In blue, we can see the GNP. And in red, we can see our hybrid system. And the black dashed line is actually a EMA model, which is a effective medium approach model. And we can see that there is correlation between our hybrid system and the effective medium approach model, which tell us that the CNT and the GNP actually create a 3D structure with, uh, that induces the percolation path because the CNT bridges between the GNP, as we can see in this illustration, and it results in higher thermal conductivity. Here I talk briefly on uh, thermal conductivity, but if you want to to hear a full lecture on thermal conductivity, you can listen to Aviala Viochayon in 150. Two minutes, please. So if you want to conclude all of our um, work, we want the robustness, the maximum fracture toughness, the electrical conductivity that I, uh, I didn't talk about due to the lack of time, and the thermal conductivity to be the higher. And we want the ONC to be as low as possible. For that, we integrated all of these properties in a radar graph, where the maximum fracture toughness, the robustness, the TC, and the EC are in the direct relation, where it's one over ONC, since you want it to be as low as possible. Where uh, uh, 
when more covered area of the radar graph means more multifunctional composite with enhanced overall material. So here we can see the, the GNP single filler system. Uh, in a blue, we can see uh, its covered uh, area. But you can see that when we add to this system only small amount of 0.15 weight percent of CNT, the covered area uh, uh, increased substantially. And uh, we can actually say that the hybrid system imposes an alternative for a multifunctional composite material with enhanced overall, um, with enhanced overall uh, uh, performance and is preferred on uh, the single filler system. I want to thank all of uh, my group members, Professor Oren Regev, Dr. Oren Adi. And if you want to uh, view the full paper that was published in Carbon, you can scan the QR code. Thank you for your attention. So on point, great talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? If, if you don't mind, I have one question. Uh, okay. I also come from the uh, field of nano, 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 carbon nanotubes. Uh, and uh, I dealt a lot with the problem of dispersion and, uh, and uh, surface treatments. So could you tell me, did you do any surface treatments like functionalization or stuff yeah. like that? Yeah, we used the NC7000 uh, CNT, where at first we did the sonication process uh, of one hour with F127. After that, we used the centrifuge uh, and we took the supernatant and put it in lufilizer. And then um, and then we use it in our composite uh, material. And we actually see that it's dispersed pretty good, actually. I'm sorry, my Zoom keeps getting stuck. Uh, so thank you for your answer. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm passing the view now to Dean Zalikovic. Let's wait just a second. Do you see my uh, presentation? Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, hi everyone, my name is uh, Dan Zlikovic, a PhD student at Professor Daniel Mandler from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Today I want to discuss with you about the Naim system, nanoparticles embedded matrices, and more specifically about the shell matrix interaction in our system. Moreover, I would like to discuss with you about a new topic, which is quite not common in our field, that called nanotoxicity. So in my presentation, I will uh, present you, I will explain you my motivation very briefly. After that, I will introduce you the Naim system. And finally, I will present you my paper and the novelty in uh, this paper. So our initial motivation is to develop a new sensor, a new detecting uh, for toxic nanoparticle in the environment. And it's not common to think about nanoparticles and particles as toxic, but in the last years, there is a great use of them in many fields, such as cosmetics, medicine, and, then, and the electronic devices. And as the, as the use of them in different technologies and products increase, the question about their toxicity to the human body and to the environment become more, uh, I think, important. 
Uh, the EPA, the United States Env Environmental Protection Agency, established a PM standard, a particular matter standard that defined inhaled uh, particles in a diameter of 2.5 and smaller as a toxic. And this definition talks only about the, the size of the nanoparticles and does not refer to the surface chemistry of them and the type of them. Um, inhaled particles in PM 2.5 can travel deeply into the lung tract and exposure to these fine particles can also affect lung function. As you can see, recently, a lot of uh, the, the, the fear of these particles and the, the effect of the environment and the human body gets a lot of media exposure. Now I want to show you a very short, uh, a very short play the, for the air conditioner company that published an air conditioner that includes filter and technology the, for this problem, for this nanoparticle. <laughs> Take care of the air you breathe. Dr. Ryan. So as you can see from the video, many companies are aware to this danger and from the PM, from the these particles and therefore try to deal with problem with a lot of technologies and a lot of filters. Uh, in a cell view, uh, because of the small size of the particles, they can penetrate the cell through the membrane. Inside the cell, they can agglomerate and interact with protein and DNA. And this interaction can cause the death of the cell. And nanoparticles toxicity depends on a lot of parameters such as size, shape, chemical composition, and even surface characteristics. So today, characterization of nanoparticles in laboratory uh, is done by different methods such as TAM, SAM, DLS, UVBs, as you all know. Uh, there are a lot of disadvantages in this method. They're all costly, cannot be applied on site. Most of them are complex. And in addition, these methods are used for specification of nanoparticles and cannot be used for detection. But there are a lot of sensors in the, in, uh, the there are a lot of sensors that are monitoring particles in the air. In Israel, there are two pre height filters and real-time optical counters that are based on mass filter, uh, but this sensor has size limitation of up to, I think, 300 nanometers. This leads us to develop a new detection system, a new detection for nanoparticles by their size, shape, and chemical properties, and my work is based mostly on electrochemistry. So a known technique that's called MIP, the molecular repeated polymer, was our inspiration to this system. The MIP approach is based on formation of cavities uh, with affinity to a specific molecule. In this process, the functional monomer and the template are polymerized together. Then the template is removed to create these functional cavities. And these functional cavities act as a synthetic receptor and uh, with a, as a synthetic receptor for a specific molecule, which fit to the binding site with high affinity and high specificity. This can be described as a lock and key model for enzymes. The MIP approach is, is uh, used for different purposes like uh, chemical separation, catalysis, sensing for small molecule or big molecule. And it brings us to this question. Can you detect nanoparticles using imprinting using the MIP process? So our motivation is to develop a simple cost-effective a, a portable sensor for nanoparticles, which could provide fast specification of virus dispersed nanomaterial. Now I want to present you uh, my paper and the novelty in this paper. So the aspect of our Naim system of our nanoparticles in print and matrices is to uh, absorb gold nanoparticles. And in my work, I, I talk about 
a conductive nanoparticles. So we absorbed gold nanoparticles on a conductive surface, following by electrographing of a real diazonium salt. After that, we oxidized the gold nanoparticles from the surface to create these functional cavities, and I call it this nanometric sensor. And after that, we rebind the gold nanoparticles to the surface, to these cavities, and we check the recognition ability of our Naim system. So the main idea in my project, and this is the novelty in this project, is to create a recognition ability that depends on supramolecular interaction between the matrix and the ligand and the shell of the nanoparticles by changing the ligand chain and more specifically by changing the strength of the hydrogen bonding between the matrix and the nanoparticle. This is highly important to control this chemical nature of the interaction, for example, using hydrogen bonding, electrostatic or van der Waals bonding. And by doing so, we increase the selectivity and the efficiency of the process. So in my project, I synthesized three different gold nanoparticles, stabilizing with citrate, with mercaptopropanoic acid, and with mercaptobenzoic acid. This gold nanoparticles is a as a relatively suitable changes in the functional group. And we want to study the effect of these minor changes on the supramolecular interaction between the matrix and the particles. And more specifically, to study the recognition ability of our system. So all the particles are 15 plus minus two nanometers. And we, we, we succeed to uh, to uh, synthesize uniform size and narrow size and all the, the structure of the nanoparticles remains spherical. We synthesize this liga, this uh, nanoparticles by ligand exchange method to bestow them with different ligand shells. The principle here is to minimize the influence of the length of the shell and to change the force of the hydrogen bonding between the matrix and the nan nanoparticles. The second stage is to create the matrix. And to achieve, to achieve this goal, I have to choose to work with a real diazonium salt with carboxylic acid as a group. And we should be able to control the thickness and the composition of the matrix very, very carefully. Uh, the electro deposition uh, of the real diazonium salt, the electrochemistry of the real diazonium salt is the well-known method and involve electrochemical reduction to form this phenyl radical. And this phenyl radical can react with almost any surfaces. Uh, moreover, the layer formation is self-limited and stop when, the, the, when we get a, a complete layer that block the electron transfer from the electrode to the solution. So as you can see here, we saw the uh, reduction peak of the real diazonium salt in the surfaces. And the, uh, uh, we saw that the reduction peak decreased with the number of scans, which means that the electrode is blocked. Sorry, Dean, uh, five minutes mark. Yeah, I know. The third step is we oxidize the nanoparticles to create these functional cavities. And, and we do the recognition ability by comparing the first oxidation peak to create this nanometric void against the first ox oxidation peak that we rebind these nanoparticles to these holes. So to check the recognition ability, as I said before, we compared the first oxidation peak for the imprinting nanoparticles and the reuptake nanoparticles. And now I want to show you the results. So the columns represent the nanoparticles that we imprinted on, and the rows represent the nanoparticles that we rebind to these cavities. And I want to divide this result in two. First, if we, we imprinted and we rebind to the surface the same nanoparticles, as you can see here, for example, if we imprinted gold nanoparticles with propanoic and we rebind to these functional cavities, the same nanoparticles, we saw that the system has high recognition ability. But in the other hand, if we imprinted one nanoparticle and we try to rebind another nanoparticle, as you can see here, the system didn't recognize them. 
for example, if we imprinted mercaptopropanoic acid and we try to result to, to rebind to the cavities, god nanoparticles with citrate, we saw that our system didn't recognize them. If I compare this all nine, uh, nine uh, experiment, we saw that our system are very, uh, uh, our system and our uh, naive system are a good recognition ability if we imprinted and we rebind the same nanoparticles. And it's very critical to my uh, project. Now we check the influence of the matrix formation on the recognition ability, and we imprinted god nanoparticles with propanoic, and we try to rebind citrate and mercaptopropanoic acid with different thicknesses of the matrix, two scan, three scan, and four scan. If the matrix is thick enough, the matrix covered the god nanoparticles, and we don't see any uh, high recognition ability. If the matrix is thin, we, the matrix didn't hold the nanoparticles in the holes, and we see a lot of non-specific uh, non absorption recognition here. But in a three scans of aryl diazonium salt, we saw, we saw that the system recognized this nanoparticle, the nanoparticle didn't be imprinted, and low, we get a low non-specific absorption recognition, as you can see here. And this is optimal to my project, to my system. So one of the most critical stage in my system is the thickness of the metric cell layer, as I said before. In the previous work, we conclude that the matrix should be more or less the radius of the nanoparticle. But here, the nanoparticles are 15 nanometer, and the matrix is more or less third of the, of the, uh, of the nanoparticles. So the thickness of the matrix is well characterized by three different methods, TEM by FIB cross-section, as you can see here, XPS and ellipsometry. And as you can see, all, the, all of them represent the same size of the matrix. So the fact that the matrix covered only third of the nanoparticles probably don't, uh, not worrying because the strong interaction between the nanoparticles and the matrix that hold the nanoparticles inside the matrix layer. So now I want to conclude. Our name system is, uh, is uh, provided to be essential for nanoparticles recognition. Our template and, and, and my, my, the, the super molecular interaction between the matrix and the nanoparticles as, are critical to, uh, to the recognition ability of the system. The name is extremely selective as you saw earlier. The matrix, the thickness of the matrix and control the thickness of the matrix is critical to prevent non-specific absorption recognition in my, uh, my system. In the future, we will, uh, we will do it with chiral nanoparticles and uh, isomer nanoparticles as well. I want to thank my super advisor, Professor Daniel Mandler, and to all my group. Thank you for your listening. So great job, Dean. Very interesting, very foreign to me. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, Daniel Pfefferman, I think. Nitai, yes, of course. I have a question that may be a little esoteric, but why exactly did you choose to go with a molecularly imprinted polymer route, not with an oxide, which seems to me more intuitive for uh, measurement? Uh, you ask why you don't use non-conductive nanoparticles? No, why don't you use uh, an, an oxide layer for the imprinting itself ah, as a matrix? Okay. So we do it in our lab, and we uh, we published an uh, an article in this field. So, for example, like we use sol gel matrices and something like that. And we and in my work, I I uh, chose to work with electrochemistry way and electrochemistry uh, diazonium. And the, um, the issue in the azonium that you can, 
you can put a lot of functional group in the diazonium and you can polymerize the diazonium with almost a lot, a lot of functional group. And it was interact a good way with these particles. All right. So if we don't have any more questions, I will finish the session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.